وإذ قرأتم في الكتاب أن الشمس تغرب في عين حمئة وكنتم تجهلون إنما الأرض تجري حول شمسها ولكن لا تشعرون These were two verses from the chapter of creation or Surat Al-Khalq, which was written by someone who apparently accepted the challenge of the Qur'an to produce a surah like it. And apparently he did. So does that now mean that the Qur'an is not miraculous anymore? Well, certainly not. Far from it, actually. This is nothing but some nonsense. But wait a minute. How did we come to this conclusion? And why did we dismiss it like that? Isn't the challenge is to produce something like the Qur'an or even one surah? Why isn't this considered to be up to the challenge? Well, while these lines do look like the Qur'an, and they might also sound like it, but you needn't look further than the meaning of whatever this is, which is silly and laughable to say the least, with complete lack of balagha or any aspects of beauty to know that this is a making of a human being, and not a very bright one at that. And just a simple look at any ayah from the Qur'an, you will see the beauty of expression, the unparalleled eloquence and incredible precise choice of words, and unmatched balagha. But while all of this is true, if we are being fair, the beauty of the text remains a subjective criterion. I mean, some, one, could look at the same ayah and claim, well, I don't really find it to be beautiful, or actually find the meaning of this to be more beautiful or as beautiful. Or even with a little bit of tweaking, this thing would also carry some beautiful aspects of balagha as well, which makes it then at least as good as the Qur'an. Well, you get the idea. Therefore, it is important to understand that the linguistic miracle of the Qur'an runs far, far deeper than just the beauty of its words and the accuracy of its expression. There are objective criteria that make even producing one short surah to be absolutely impossible. Let's first start with a simple example, just to point out the premise before we explain it. And the purpose of this example is not to compare, just to illustrate the idea. William Shakespeare said, To be or not to be, that is the question. He also said, All that glitters is not gold. If I then come and say, To eat or not to eat, that is the question. And then I said, All that glitters is not diamond, it could be glass. Does that now make me as good as Shakespeare, as a playwright? It would be silly to think so. Just because I took this eloquent quote from Shakespeare and then changed some words around a little bit and then added some stuff here and there doesn't mean that now I made a quote that is as good. It only makes me look stupid. But what was originally unique and noteworthy about the work of Shakespeare at the time is that he thought of a unique way to deliver a certain message. Simple words, full of meaning. That's why some of the quotes are still alive today. So, to be as good, I need to think of a unique quote that is influential enough to be remembered years from today. Not just to imitate some of what he said and play with words around a little bit and then claim victory. That is just a very shallow way of thinking. But now is the question, what is then so linguistically miraculous about the Qur'an that truly made it a miracle that can never be imitated or even come close to it. In other words, what are the limits of eloquence in a text that separates a very beautiful text that is made by humans from miraculous divine text from Allah? We'll investigate only three of more than 50 miraculous aspects of the Book of Allah that we know of, which make the book unmatchable. First, the Qur'an a new system. Before the Qur'an was revealed, Arabs had poetry and prose. There was no other form of literature. But when the Qur'an was revealed, there was poetry, prose, and the Qur'an. In fact, the Qur'an was so revolutionary and groundbreaking as literature that it didn't belong to either poetry or prose. It was a whole new system that even had its own jargon, which are unique words 
that specially belong to the Qur'an. The word Qur'an itself, the word surah, ayah, tilawa, or tala, and all this kind of words that uniquely belong to the Qur'an. Interestingly, none of these words was promptly defined at the beginning of the book, as you would expect from a new book to tell us what Qur'an is, and what is an ayah, a surah, but for some reason, that was never needed in the case of the Qur'an. Arabs just understood what each of these words meant, and it fit perfectly in what the Qur'an was all about. So, the first question for those who want to take up the challenge of the Qur'an, can you come up with a piece of work that is so significant and unique in itself that it would create a fourth branch here of literature? Can you do that? Second, a new branch of knowledge. The Qur'an came with a brand new branch of knowledge, Tajweed. Tajweed is the way we should read the Qur'an. It is true that some aspects of Tajweed were indeed part of how Arabs talked, like heavy, light letters, qalqala, iqlab, but Arabs didn't elongate words, which is using mad, they didn't extend the ghunna of noon in certain situations. They didn't apply ikhfa as we would do when reading the Qur'an. These are just some of the unique features of the Qur'an that are applied on the Qur'an when read. And these rules have been passed down from the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, till this very day. So the second question now is, that surah you're thinking about making to look like the Qur'an, remember to also devise a new system with which you can read your surah, and it has to be a unique branch of knowledge. What comes next is even more miraculous. Third, novelty. The Qur'an was revealed in Arabic. So what can be new about it then? Well, this can be investigated in three categories. First, the Qur'an used words that Arabs knew and recognized, but they were used in new ways. And there was also completely new Arabic words that were derived from Arabic roots. And then there was also new expressions, or as we also say, language chunks. So these three types of new words, let's look at them one by one and understand what they mean. The first type, words like Sultan, Marad, Yanzurun, Aslama, Tawalla, Qum, Al Ajr, Al Ihsan, Al Qiyama, Al Nar, and hundreds of other words. Arabs knew all of these words, but in the Quran, they were used in such a way that gave them a new dimension and a new meaning. But the most surprising part in all of that is that when they were used like that, Arabs were able to understand exactly what they meant. Take the word marad as an example. Arabs knew what this word meant, sickness. But when it was used as fi qulubihim marad, it was easy for them to realize that this was not a real sickness, a physical one. Sickness of the heart is doubt and affectation. And yet, when it was used in this context, it made perfect sense, and they directly understood what exactly it meant, without having to explain it or define what it means. Another example is the word, qum, means to stand up. But when it was used in Surat Al-Muddathir, qum fa'anvir, it was used with the meaning of to commence, but because of the way it was used in the ayah, it didn't need any explanation or introduction. Another example is the word Sultan, which was known to Arabs as Sultan or ruler, but its metaphorical use in the Qur'an gave it a new meaning, which is authority. And so many other examples that actually impacted how Arabs viewed these words. And we're not talking about just one or two words, we're talking about hundreds of words which weren't only new and original in their use, but they were clear and unambiguous. And achieving this not just once, but many, many times, even within the same surah, this is truly miraculous. What about the second type? New words that were derived from Arabic roots. While these words did come from Arabic roots, the form of such words was still new to Arabs. But just like the previous type, these words didn't need any exposition or explanation. So for example, Arabs knew 
yura'i, but they didn't know ri'a'. They knew ittaqa, but not attaqwa. Ash-shukr was known to them, but not ash-shukur. They knew al-alam, but they never thought of using it in plural, al-alamin. So while anyone can come up with new words, the true miracle here is combining novelty and unambiguity. And not just once, but throughout the entire book. And readers were still able to understand the perfectly conveyed message. And if you're finding it difficult to understand how can something so new be so clear, that is exactly why it is called a miracle. And one of many reasons why it can't be replicated. But to really understand the scale of such miracle and challenge, the first full surah to be revealed was Al-Muddathir, which is made up of 256 words. This surah alone contains at least 84 new words. They are Arabic words, but Arabs either didn't use them in the same way, or they were original words derived from Arabic roots. 84 words is about one-third of the two-page surah. However, Arabs had no problem understanding what the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, recited to them, and could only say that this was nothing but magic. The Qur'an didn't only come with new words, but also new ways to say things and express them. And again, clarity perfectly combined with originality. Take for example, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Arabs knew both words, but using them in this way, in this combination, that was never done before. Maliki Yawmiddin. The word Malik is owner, and Yawm means day. Arabs never used this combination in this way. How can you own a day, a piece of time? And yet, in its context, it made perfect sense what this was referring to. And every single surah contains a combination of all of these. Yet the result is clear, concise, and beautiful, all at the same time. And in case you're wondering how we were able to conclude which words and expressions were used by Arabs before the Qur'an and which were not, these conclusions were drawn based on comparisons with Arabic poetry, prose, and the speeches that they produced before Qur'an revelation. And so we could conclude which words, expressions, and phrases were used and how they were used before the revelation of the Qur'an. And I think now we are starting to understand more how it was possible for someone like Umar ibn al-Khattab, for example, like so many others of the Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with all of them, became Muslim just by listening to a couple of ayat, and that's it. It was incredibly clear to them, when they first heard it, that this cannot be the doing of humans. This must be from a higher power. It also explains to us how some scholars try to explain al-huruf al muqatta'ah at the beginning of surahs. Think of it like that. You were invited by someone for dinner, and you were presented with a meal that was so delicious that you almost lost your mind. And so you asked the host about the ingredients, to which he just simply answered, well, the ingredients are water, flour, and yeast. That's it. And this answer itself makes you even more unable to understand how he could put this meal together in such a way with such simple ingredients. As many scholars explained, Al-Huruf al are a direct challenge to the disbelievers by just showing the basic and the simple components of the words of Allah. And yet, they cannot come up with anything that matches this miraculous book. So unless you are able to match these standards and actually many more, you shouldn't even think about challenging the word of Allah. And if you want to learn to understand the Qur'an in Arabic and really appreciate its miracle, then you can start right here. And don't forget to check my latest book, which goes perfectly with this course. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.